Let's talk about how to have a healthy relationship as an OF content creator. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to explore what it's like being an OF content creator and how to have a healthy relationship with it. Of course, this isn't just advice for people in OF. You can be any kind of adult content creator and hopefully this podcast might help you. With that said, I wanna go ahead and just clarify, specify, make sure people are aware that OF is an adult website. This is for adults about adults. This is a career choice that you can participate in once you're 18 plus. And this lifestyle is very specific. It has lots of pros and lots of cons. Like most jobs, there are some, well, there is some baggage that can come along with this line of work. I haven't always done it actually. As many of you guys know, I have been doing YouTube since I was out of high school. So I didn't always do adult work. My journey was actually, I guess, a little unorthodox, maybe more common, less common. I'm not actually sure if my journey is similar to yours. So please let me know in the comment sections down below. But my journey didn't start off with adult work. I never thought about doing it. It wasn't something that was in my vision as a person growing up in a conservative household. It was something I stumbled across years, years into my, um, I guess, into my exploring my body and exploring my image and exploring who I was stage. It came so many years later. I think I actually got an OF during the pandemic. And prior to that, never considered myself a sex worker. So I'm pretty new to the title and owning the label compared to many other people. If you guys don't know much about me, I'm 34. My name is Brittany. I started off being, a, well, I was started off raised as a conservative and a homeschool environment until I was in high school. I did like two years of public high school. I was a closeted queer kid. I was a nerdy vampire girl. I like, you know, I always say I have an inner goth, even though my everyday clothing choice is pretty much like sweats and a hoodie. I am a person who grew up questioning, wondering, exploring. I wanted to solve mysteries and figure out like, who am I? I grew up struggling with mental illness and I grew up struggling with my identity. I eventually into my late 20s got diagnosed with a few things that helped clarify a lot of the reasons why I was struggling most of my life. Every day I have a new epiphany about myself, but as of late, I'm realizing that I have a really good relationship with sex work and I would like to talk about how I got here. So growing up conservative, I had a really strange relationship with my body right? I think a lot of people who come from conservative backgrounds do. But in particular, I grew up Catholic and I grew up with pretty strict parents. I mean, this certainly would not be uh, a clothing choice I could wear around my family. And though my family and I have a great relationship now, it was kind of turbulent growing up. Some really good moments and then some not so great moments. My parents definitely grew up with a strict idea of how women should dress. So I dressed as a boy a lot of my life because the best way to feel most relaxed in a pressure, well, in a household that had so much pressure in relation to what you look like, dressing like a boy removed all of that pressure because at least I was modest. At least I could be myself. At least I could run around and hang out with people. Now, as I got older, my mom would say things like, why don't you dress like more like a girl? Why don't you wear a dress? Why don't you look more feminine? And the truth is, is because there was a lot of pressure in looking feminine. There was a lot of pressure in looking like a girl. When I was dressing like a girl, I was told I was flirting with boys from the age of like nine till I was older. When I dressed like a girl, there came a lot more attention that I didn't want on me. My boobs grew in pretty quickly as a child. I think I went through puberty um, not earlier than my friends. I think I was about the same age, but my body developed, I think, just bigger. <laughs> you know, I had these hips and I had these boobs. And I think there was a lot of pressure that came with that that I just didn't want responsibility for. So until I was about maybe 15, 16, I didn't dress like a girl. I dressed like a boy. Very big sweaters, very big clothes. I just didn't want that kind of attention. But I think I craved thinking that somebody could be attractive to me. I mean, I was reading book after book after book, hoping that somebody would pick me, somebody would love me, somebody would see me and and really like get me. You know what I mean? Of course, being an angsty 15-year-old emo kid, I think that was maybe more toxic, that version of love that I wanted than the love I have now. But growing up, there was some sort of desire there. I just didn't know how to get it without selling a part of my soul. So as I got older, and I was a virgin at 21 years old. I finally moved out of my parents' house and I was coming out. I was coming out as a lesbian, as many of you guys know the story. Of course, now I know I'm pansexual and all that stuff. But at the time, coming out, went to San Diego, went to Hillcrest, partied with my friends, got to know people, knew people of all different variations, backgrounds, you know, cultures, all that stuff. 
came to discover after a long time that I actually liked being nude. But I didn't necessarily want to do sex work. I wasn't even thinking about it. I, at 21, finally had sex for the first time. And then, it per, you know, progressed from there. I had multiple sexual partners by the time I hit 30, about eight or so, men and women, mostly women, some non-binary people. And I had all variations of sexual interaction with these people, mostly centered around kink, BDSM, or very sex-positive bubbles, like very sex-positive vibes. So I was allowed to explore my body, be free with my body, feel safe in my body. I was allowed to practice nudity. I was allowed to do the solstice parade in Seattle where I could ride a bike naked. I was able to have a relationship with my body that wasn't accessible to me growing up in Orange County, California. And so because I was in Seattle, because I eventually moved there in 2012, because I spent five years there, I had access to the kink community. I had access to the queer communities. I had access to these poly communities. I had access to communities that allowed me to feel free in my body. I remember the first time I ever got naked at a BDSM dungeon. I, you know, was in this environment where sex wasn't the focus of the BDSM unless you wanted it to be. I was practicing non-sexual BDSM. I had sexual partners who did BDSM as well, of course. But I remember being at the dungeon not feeling comfortable with my body, not feeling like I could be naked in front of people. And this man was there who had recently un underwent a surgery for a sickness, and he was feeling self-conscious about his body too. And he asked me if I wanted to like walk around. And I asked him like, do you want to walk around? Yeah, like we decided and negotiated on the spot. Let's walk around together so we can feel more comfortable in our bodies. So we stripped down, walked around the dungeon, came back, put our clothes back on. And it was an amazing feeling to finally let go of so many body insecurities that we had had. You know, the world always talks about body positivity. And I think there's so much politicization of the movement that has like killed it absolutely and even I dislike it but I will say when you're in a body positive environment that is about actually overcoming your fears about what you look like and or owning up to kind of how you've taken care of your body it can feel really really safe and wonderful so here I was I think I was probably uh 21 22 23 like 23 24 at the time at 25, 26, 25, 26, all variations of my 20s differently. Uh, Orange County to Seattle, I was involving myself in BDSM communities, but Seattle is where I had most of my adventures. I was just figuring out who I was, just figuring out what I liked, figuring out who I wanted to date, who I wanted to be, you know, how I wanted to care for my body, how I wanted to present my body. My body has gone through a lot of fluctuations. I'm 5'1". I've gone from super, super thin to fat to thin again to bulky to chunky to I've had a lot of relationships with my body. I've had it nude and clothed. I've actually, when I was professionally nannying in Seattle, because that's what I did for a career until I could do YouTube full time, because I always worked multiple jobs. I even ran into some of my nanny families at these nudist events because they were not sexually focused. The point was I was trying to have a relationship with my body in the nude that wasn't about someone else having sex with me. And that was possible in a cultural bubble that allowed that exploration to occur with no pressure of sex. So, I mean, these were events that were like family focused, just normie focused, just everyone exploring this weird cultural phenomenon focused. And some people were weird there for sure, but those people usually got shooed away. Okay, so here I was exploring that part of my life, posting on Tumblr. I remember when I posted my first nudes on Tumblr, I was so proud of myself because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing it. I'm like facing myself. I remember posting nude uh, for free most of my life. And then during the pandemic, people were like, get an OnlyFans, get an OnlyFans, get an OnlyFans. And I was like, oh, well, I don't want to get an OnlyFans. And people think that I do sex work. And then people think that, you know, they're going to expect a product from me. I just want to be able to post what I post. And people were like, no, we won't. We won't expect a product from you. And I was like, okay. So I started an OnlyFans. And it went really well and people were really excited about it. And I'm glad that you were there for that. I feel like it taught me so much about the relationship I wanted to have with my body. And I remember the decision I had made when I was doing this OnlyFans to convert it into sex work. I remember being like, actually, I think I want to own this title. Actually, I want to own this label. Actually, I think that I want to actually try this for realsies. I want to show myself fully. Up until the pandemic, I had never been fully nude on camera. I'd never shown my vulva vagina. I'd never shown my labia. I'd never shown that much of myself to the world. And then finally, I decided to do it. And I don't regret that. Now, I know money making wise, I could have waited until like now to do it and I would have made more money. But it's not about the money. The money's nice. 
and in terms of a job, super important. We'll get to that in a second. But in terms of the relationship that I'm having as a real consciousness in relation to sex work, it was about me. Could I do this even if money wasn't involved? Did I want to do this even if money wasn't involved? And the answer is yes. I want to be so comfortable in my body. I want to feel so free in my body that I'm not ashamed of it. That it is just what it is. That if, God forbid, I ever had to strip naked in the middle of the road, I'd be like, yeah, well, it's an emergency and I can do this because I have already gone through all the trials and tribulations of feeling comfortable in my own skin. That's going to sound like I'm asking like all of society to do this, but I'm not. I'm just saying for me, that was the journey I needed to go on. So growing up conservative where I didn't even want to show off like my legs because I wasn't even allowed, right, to basically being naked, to fully being naked, to all the way being naked, to actually doing sex work, you can imagine it's been quite a journey. And if you find yourself wondering like, Am I ever going to be comfortable in my own skin? I think it's a journey in a relationship you're having with yourself. And I think when you involve other people in it, that's what kills it. I think when you're focused on your body only being validated by outside sources, you've lost the plot. Is this about you or is this about them? And them can't matter. It's about you. Now, with that said, as a content creator, I really like making content. I like making a product that I think is good and that's worthy of your money. I recently have been putting out some posts that I really, really like, and I'm trying to like be more ethereal and vibe it up. And I'm having a lot of fun with sounds and textures. And I have seen the uptick. I've seen people liking the work. I've seen you joining and I appreciate that. But mostly I appreciate that people can see that I have like a vision when it comes to my sex work. It's hard for me to have a vision when it comes to my life, but when it comes to my sex work, I want to have a clear one. An ethereal goddess, like, is very important. And also, I'm working out again, so hopefully I'll have muscle arms, and maybe we can do some, like, fun dummy stuff, right? There's, like, so many venues I can go down, but it's about creating a vision, right? So what is my vision saying to you, what is my vision saying for me? As a content creator, there are pros and cons to this job. Just like any other job, you wanna make sure you're doing it for you. Trust me, as kid, like kids of an immigrant, okay, I'm a kid of an immigrant, two immigrants, obviously my parents are both from Iraq. There is a pressure to be a certain kind of person. There's a pressure to have a certain kind of job or a pressure to be a certain kind of, you know, upstanding citizen in the way that they view you, mostly religious. And if you don't meet that criteria, you're kind of a failure no matter how much money you make, no matter what you look like, no matter what kind of family you have. If it didn't fit their original standard, <clears throat> losing my voice here, if it didn't fit their standard, you failed. So I had to make sure that I was going to succeed because I knew I succeeded, not because anyone told me that I did. And so when I chose sex work, I chose it in conjunction with YouTube. I prioritize YouTube because it is my primary source of income. It's what I primarily like to do. But obviously I love sex work and I can't stop doing it. I just love doing it. I think being honest with myself about the fact that I do like doing it, that I do find myself taking off my clothes, that I like to see naked photos of myself, that I like to see the ways I can put an outfit together. I think this is really important. This is a relationship I'm having with myself once again. It it goes out to the public, the public consumes it, but it is about me. Just like every YouTuber who has content that matters to them, this is about us. And then we're consumable at the same time. My life is consumable. I've decided that as a YouTube content creator. I know that. It doesn't feel different to me to do OnlyFans versus YouTube, but what feels different is a relationship I'm having with myself doing those jobs. You know, when I started off on YouTube, my dad was the reason I became a YouTuber because he really wanted me to be like I Justine. But eventually I took a different direction. I became more liberal. I came out. I did queer content. I did pro BDSM content. And my dad stopped watching my content. He started saying, Betsy, I know you're on a journey and I wish you would take a different one, more Christ-like, but I can't watch your content. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. I don't really want you to. I want to do my own thing. I'm 34 now. I certainly want to do my own thing when it comes to my body. People will always ask me, what's your relationship with your parents? Now it's pretty great, but they're religious people. They have a completely different relationship with reality. They believe in a God. I don't believe in a God. I think I'm an animal evolved over time and taking off my clothes just can't matter. But to them, they think it really matters. And so because of that, there's like a disconnect. There's a don't ask, don't tell policy. There's a, yeah, I do nude work and it. my parents know it, but like, what are they going to do? Tell their 35, 34-year-old daughter who doesn't live at home, who's literally like in another country, don't do adult work? 
No, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Plus they raised me as an American. So I believe in freedom and freedom to me looks like being able to do OnlyFans, being able to be nude, being able to do art shows, being able to do different things with my body. For me, being free means being this. Now for all people, that's not true. For some people, this is like their prison. This is like scary to them. For some women, they don't want to be objectified in any way. And I think that's fair. I don't want to be objectified either. I don't want to be seen as second class. I don't want to be seen as icky. But some people will always see you that way, even if you're not a sex worker. Some people will see you as icky and other because of the color of your skin. So why am I working so hard to appeal to a group or a populace of people that no matter what I do will never like me. That does not make sense to me. But I understand the pressures people feel to appeal. I understand the pressures people feel to make people like them. But I, I think I'd rather focus on making the right people like me, people who aren't afraid of the human body, people that are pro-nudity, people who are truly pro-sex or, pro, or, or sex positive, because I am fundamentally pro-sex like sex positive. Sex positive is very specific. I think a lot of people have a lot of sex and so they think they're sex positive, but no, sex positive is very specific, right? I always like to use the example of fresh and fit. A lot of people see that fresh and fit have a lot of sex, but they're obviously very sex negative, right? They demonize women for having sex. They demonize themselves for even having sex. They don't even know if they like it. I think I've even heard fit say things and I could be wrong that he's not even, he doesn't even care if his partner gets off or not. He just wants to come so he can say he fucked a girl. Like that's a very specific relationship you're having with sex that I just don't think is positive. I don't think you're actually pro-sex. If you're demonizing sex, if you're saying if you have too much sex, it's bad, you're not sex positive. Now on a spectrum, people have different relationships with sex positivity, but I'm probably on the more extreme end. I think you should be consent-based, knowledge-based. I think you should be safe. But I think ultimately what you do with your body is your business. As a content creator, I think if you take into consideration how it's impacting society, you can think of it as the content creator to your audience. How is it impacting my audience? I do practice a very specific kind of ethical um, sex positivity where if I'm a sex worker, I try to be very honest with my audience. I don't pretend that I'm available. I don't pretend that we're ever going to meet. I don't pretend that I'm ever going to date you. I don't lie to you about my relationship status. I wear my wedding ring, my engagement ring in my videos and content. I am not trying to trick people into thinking I'm single and could possibly date you. There are some artists, some sex workers that do this ethically and unethically. Some who do it ethically are putting on a persona and the persona is what you're falling in love with. You're not falling in love with the real person. But I think people with parasocial relationships can forget that and turn it toxic. Then there are content creators who maliciously intend to lie to their customers, who maliciously actually try to almost gaslight and convince their customers like, I'm going to be with you one day. You just wait. I'm going to be with you one day. And I think that's super unethical. I think at that point, it's not even a parasocial relationship. You're literally telling people you're going to be with them versus a person who's creating a persona to say like, oh yeah, we're going to be together, but it's part of the persona. Then it's more on the audience member to be really reasonable with how they're interacting with a persona. So I think there is a very blurred, nuanced line and you can't always know what you're dealing with. So, you know, act with caution. Be thoughtful and considerate as the content creator and as the customer about how we're overlapping and interacting. Because to be honest with you, before I found my spouse, before I found my partner, I did go on a date with somebody from my OnlyFans. He hit me up. Um, he was really nice. We went on a date via Zoom and it was good, but like he wasn't my person. And I have no problem with that because I as a requirement, need somebody who's going to be pro-sex work, who's going to be sex positive. One of the requirements for my perfect partner was that they were sex positive in a real way. So like I said before, it's a spectrum. My partner and I are very sex positive. So of course, when I started dating him, the first thing I said was like, I'm on OnlyFans. And he was like, yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> I've seen your OnlyFans. And I said, I'm a YouTuber, which he knew, of course, because we met via my Discord. He wasn't one of my viewers, but he happened to find me while I was doing a lot of collabs and from someone else's audience 
audience, someone else's audience, someone ended up stumbling across my work and joined my community to see if he could find cool people to hang out with. And he found me to hang out with. We never stopped talking from the moment we started. And it ended up flourishing into a long life committed relationship. Look, I'm a content creator. And I'm not going to pretend like I wasn't hoping somebody would come across my work and fall in love with my brain and want to marry me. I think I have a great mind. I think my ideas are amazing. I think I have a lot to contribute to the world. And I wanted somebody who would appreciate that from my philosophy work to my reaction work to my sex work. I wanted someone who could really see me and say, okay, Brittany's just like she's doing something like Brittany has intention. Brittany is chilling. Yes. But Brittany is thoughtful. Brittany's work is means something to her. So I would never take it away from her. Right. My partner would never ask me to stop doing sex work. He wouldn't get with me and then ask me to change. He fell in love with the person that I am, like from head to toe, right? From thought to action, a person who he respects because I walk the walk. I like my work. I'm very transparent with him. I'm willing to change certain things, you know, to build a life with him, of course, but nothing foundational to who I am, right? Like we're monogamous. That's great. I'm good with that. I've been poly. I've been mono. I've done a lot of different kinds of relationships. But for me and who I am, meeting somebody who wanted to be monogamous was not a problem for me. I was kind of open to all variations of lifestyle, but truly monogamy really works for me. So we're a very happy monogamous couple. Now, for some people, that could be frustrating. For some people, they could, you know, hope that their partner is poly or a relationship anarchy or all kinds of different variations of open. These are why you have to have, or this is why you have to have those conversations ahead of time. So you're not dating somebody and then six months in, you either surprise them with a change or you lie only to change later or you hope you'll change them or you're going to hope you're going to rescue them. One of my pet peeves is when I've gone on dates with certain men and they're like, I really can't wait for you to stop doing OnlyFans. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to stop doing OnlyFans because again, that's like asking me to stop doing YouTube. You married someone who's a content creator. You're dating someone who's a content creator. Why would I stop doing content creation, right? That doesn't make sense. Now, in some ways, we change for our partners. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. I'm definitely less flirty with everybody. Like prior to getting into my relationship, I mean, I was much more flirty with everyone because I was also single and I was allowed to mingle. But now that I'm partnered, I obviously like cut it off. I'm very strict with who I flirt with. I try to flirt with only people that are, you know, more queer or at least um, know that flirting can be platonic. I try to be very cautious about my flirting. I try to make sure with him that it's okay and good and he doesn't feel uncomfortable. And same with him. Like I'm very, we have very specific rules about how we interact with other people. You know, we ain't we ain't out here kissing other people you feel me we're certainly not out here exchanging nudes we're not out here doing any of that we do that with each other <laughs> so for us we have our own rules and of course Brittany single isn't going to be Brittany in a relationship so of course when I post something I usually cover it with him first like hey babe do you have any problems with this? I'm about to post it. And he'll look at it and be like, no, you do you. I trust you. And I'm like, I know, but just for my own mental health, is this okay? Like he's so relaxed and so trusts me that he knows I'll make the best decision possible. But then I so am considerate of him. I'm so aware that I don't want to hurt him that I just want to make sure all the same. Because we're looking out for each other, because we're rooting for each other, it's very easy to have a relationship with somebody and it's very easy to have a relationship in which we both feel safe, even though I do sex work. Now, if you are in a relationship and you're thinking about changing it up and doing sex work, you gotta be ready for a breakup. If you are young and you're getting into sex work, you might end up eliminating people from possibly being your partner. This is just real life. In real life, everything about us deters or invites certain people into our life. Look at what I'm wearing. I've got lots of besties in my life. None of them dress like this. None of them date men like I date. None of them date women like I date. This is a very specific outfit that says to a very specific crowd, I am Brittany. And if you are very specific in who you are, you're going to invite very specific people into your life. So don't freak out if OnlyFans is the reason people won't date you. They would have found another reason. Your hair, your skin tone, your religious background, your body count. Ultimately, everyone has a reason they don't want to date people. I've been on so many dates with so many great people. And sometimes there's not even a reason so much as it's, it's not exactly right. You're a great person and you're a good person. But it's not exactly right. So many people are used to settling 
that I think they see this as, oh, you're just so spoiled. You want this perfect partner. No, I want to be such a good partner to you that I don't want to lie to you. If it's not exactly what I'm looking for, I'm going to be a miserable partner for you. And look, I found him. I was picky through the pandemic. I went on a lot of first dates, but I was waiting for the right person. I did a lot of guys that were sex positive, a lot of guys that were pro only fans, a lot of guys that were cool with my work, but he was the one that was exactly right in every category. Do you get what I'm saying? I didn't have to settle because I found the person, not the one, because I don't believe in the one, but I found the one of the many I would have been compatible with. But in particular, he was the first one I came across that was one of those many. And so therefore, he's the only one I'm interested in now. And that's the reality that I live in, that I pick and choose who I want to be with. I pick and choose my job. I pick and choose my joy. My joy coincides with how relaxed and and what kind of intimate relationship I have with my body. I like my body. I worked really hard to have a good relationship with it. And I certainly love making money doing it. I really do. And my audience is amazing on OF. They're so encouraging, so positive. Boys, girls, non-binaries, like very positive group of people. If I could have more of that in my life, I would be honored. I love that they're here with me on my journey, but they're also so respectful and so lovely that I know I'm signaling the right kind of energy to the right kind of audience. And that is something that I'm looking forward, or not looking forward, hello, looking to do as a content creator. So as a content creator, I'm always trying to make sure that I know my audience. I want my audience to be sex positive. So I want my audience to be less pressure and more, ooh, interesting, ooh, is this what we're doing? I don't mind if you take a break. I don't mind if you go away. I don't mind if you come back every month. I'm just happy to have you there for a little while. My goal as a content creator is not to make the most money. It's to make the right amount of money for the right audience. I want to have the right audience and I think the money follows. Now, this is also why I'm a middle class OnlyFans girl, okay? I'm not one of the top percent percenters. I'm not like 1%, you know what I'm saying? I have a very niche audience. I like that. But that's because for my own mental health, I can't handle the pressure of having millions of people interested in my work. I can't even handle that on YouTube. So you have to know yourself in order to be a good content creator. You also have to be a good to yourself and know your limitations. I wanna talk about the cons of OnlyFans or adult work in general, and I wanna talk about some of the negative stereotypes that tend to be true. So you know the stereotypes with women at least that they have daddy issues and that's why they do sex work? It is true that the, in, in my personal anecdotal experience, a majority of the people that I meet in sex work have some variation of trauma that they're dealing with. For me, the trauma was in relation to finding power in my body and in my form. For me, it was in relation to me feeling like I didn't have agency over my body my whole life. I felt like I was trapped in my conservative bubble, being told, you know, I had to be modest, being told as I got older when I was assaulted that it was my fault, being told that even though I was a virgin until 21, I was still slutty because I was flirty, being told that my body wasn't my own and I had to dress it for the right people and hold it, you know, a certain way to be treated a certain way. I had a very... Um, just, I had a very, I just had a, uh, a bad taste in my mouth when it came to people trying to control how I lived my life. So I sought a future of control, having a good relationship with myself saying, this is my vessel. I get to do what I want with it. And that included being naked on the internet, being naked in Seattle, doing, you know, just skinny dipping and nudist runs and hanging out with cool hippies and trying to figure out how to feel comfortable in my own skin. And those groups are not perfect. There's plenty of predators in every community. BDSM, poly, nudists, there's plenty of predators everywhere. So be careful because these communities have a tendency to pretend like they're picture perfect, they're amazing, they're so positive, but there's a lot of disadvantages, just like with the porn industry. There's a lot of predatory behavior. Even OnlyFans, there's predatory behavior. So be cautious, be aware of those things. I recently saw Whitney Cummings and Riley Reed do a podcast together and to be honest with you, I think both Whitney Cummings and Riley Reed, who like, again, I watch Whitney, I like Whitney's stuff. I think they're perfect examples of people who are coping so hard with life. They obviously have horrible relationships with their families, as we know from all of their stories. Riley has some of the worst stories, in my opinion, about her relationships with her family members. And they're both on this weird journey where they've settled into relationships that were kind of quickly had. They got pregnant accidentally. Now they're having babies randomly because like, why not? 
And I think that there are good examples of people that aren't having the most healthy relationships with themselves, but they're doing their best. And I want to rise above that. I want to make sure that my trauma isn't leading me into my 40s. And I want to make sure that I'm not coping. And I want to make sure I'm not getting accidentally pregnant in my 40s. Like I want to make sure I'm being very responsible with how I'm going about um, producing children, all these things. Now, I don't know the exact details. Maybe I heard the podcast wrong about exactly how the pregnancies happened. But from the way that I understood it when I heard it, it didn't sound very thoughtful. And I want to be extra, extra thoughtful. Even Belle, um, Belle Delphine, who I love Belle. I think Belle's really interesting and I, I like her content well enough. Belle also was not very thoughtful when she started sex work. She was a minor and put her face on the bodies of other sex workers. That's not okay. But again, if you look at the relationship Belle had with the people in her life growing up, it wasn't the greatest. So there's something to be said about this stereotype. Lana Rhodes is another great example. I've done videos about Lana. She grew up in a horrible environment and she became one of the world's top sex workers. I think no matter how we want to splice it, there is a certain type of stereotype that does match a reality. So what do you do when you're actually more healthy and so you have better boundaries? So you don't just say yes to everything thrown your way. You end up up in a more peaceful situation. Now, those women aren't evil or bad because they ended up where they were, but there's a lot of harm that occurs that could be avoided for newer generations. So for myself, I've had really good experiences doing sex work. I was old. I got to make the decision. I never felt pressured. I've always worked solo. I haven't had any horror stories doing sex work because I don't, I was already really confident in who I was and I knew why I was doing what I was doing and I was using meditation and you know kind of spiritualism to help me through my sex work versus a lot of these people are coping with their trauma one of the other content creators that, that comes to mind is coconut kitty god rest her soul but coconut kitty became famous a couple years back because she's a woman in her 30s who is aging like down her face and body to look young like really young like sometimes too young and she amassed a great following myself included i actually dm'd coconut kitty one time because there was a time in my life where i was like oh this is a really interesting look this is really and this was before she like really made her look young i mean there was a point where she kind of just looked young but i knew it was fake so i was like oh that's an interesting idea but then she went so far that i was like oh girl too young what are you doing and i stopped following her but i wrote to her and she dm me back just a very pleasant like i like your work da, 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 da. i found out she committed suicide and i was devastated because no offense it's pretty clear that she has a very toxic relationship with existence it was clear that coconut kitty was suffering it was clear that she had problems but man to have to to have to kill yourself because of your relationship with your work and your life, this is what I would like to avoid for sex workers in the future and present. If you guys don't really know, Coconut Kitty, at least from the articles I've read, committed suicide because she had basically gotten so much backlash over her work and encouraging sort of like pedo energy audiences that she had no more friends to really lean on. Now, I don't know how true that is, of course, but I wouldn't be surprised. And honestly, if I was in her life, I'd also tell her to stop. I would tell her, change the content. She saw it as her being an artist because she was also a painter, I believe. But at the same time, like the audience she amassed, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Because God knows these perverted people out here, these pedo people, are probably sending her messages. She's internalizing it. She's encouraging it. She's creating a legal sex work uh, content, legal sex work content that is appealing to a very grotesque, degenerate part of society in a way that is just so distasteful to me because, again, it involves children that I can't be about it. And I understand that when we're having this conversation, it, it, it begs the question of why. And I think if I got a chance to talk to Coconut Kitty, maybe we could have talked about it. This is why I'm, I really want to help people go from toxic to healthier. It's not be like Britney. I don't want that. I just want you to be healthier. I don't want you to kill yourself. I don't want you to think like, I have to go down this path. I don't want you to be a person who just gets pregnant. I don't want you to be a person who regrets doing sex work like Lana Rhodes. I don't want you to be a person who regrets their life because you weren't given a chance to just think about it first. I like my job, but it might not be for you. And I don't want you to do a job 
that you think you have to do that leads you to burnout and suicide because society has pressured you to do it. Suicide is up in men. And men often get this because of their workloads, their jobs, the work they do as soldiers. I also don't want that. No matter how you splice it, all of us offer our bodies to society. You have to pick the job that doesn't break you down. You have to pick the job that lifts you up. Or you have to pick the job that's neutral. For me, I chose a job that lifts me up. I really like my job, YouTube and OnlyFans. But for some people, it could bring them down, right? I am sex positive. So for me, I just want to have a healthier relationship with sex. But if you're sex negative, I wouldn't do sex work, right? If you're coconut kitty, I would really consider why you feel okay creating work that represents or looks like basically a child. What brings a woman in her 30s to make this kind of work? Because it's not healthy. And if somebody's that unhealthy, can they be helped? And that is something that I'm mulling over. At what point do we help people? A lot of people tried to reach out to her, but a lot of people mostly tried to crucify her. And so in some ways, maybe Hello uh, Hello Kitty, maybe Coconut Kitty was never meant to be saved because no one ever really thought she could be. Overall, how to have a healthy relationship with sex work comes down to the why you're doing it. Why are you doing sex work? Are you doing it just to make money? Cool. Get in, get out. Just like football players, right? Get in, get out. Don't stay long enough to get brain damage. You feel me? A lot of football players would join the NFL with a plan to get out quickly because they know long term it causes immense damage to your body and brain. Be strategic if you're in it for the money. Get in, get out. If you're in it because you think it's a good way to explore your body, you could stay in it till you're 99. One of my favorite pastimes is actually to find like elderly sex workers who are do, still doing it and or who talk about doing it in the past and just seeing how they're doing. Some of them really like their life. Most of them speak very highly of their past. Some of them have issues. Some people do porn and are very successful and then become advocates of anti-porn. Everyone has a different journey, but don't make your trauma my trauma. I've had a very good relationship with sex work. So if you haven't, I'm sorry about that. But I have. And I would like more people to have healthy relationships. You know, it's funny that people who have bad relationships with sex work, their automatic thought is, now I have to stop people from doing it. Instead of, how can I make sex work healthy for people? Now, if you think sex work is never going to be healthy for people, I don't know what to tell you. I think that feels like giving up. I think sex work can be healthy for people because it comes down to the relationship you're having with yourself. So why are you doing sex work? And then when you're dating somebody, getting married to somebody, how do you have that conversation with them? I'm a person who just very bluntly says it on the first date. Hey, this is what I do. This is my life. What do you think? Does it match with your life? Does it like, I don't do the whole like, you better take it or leave it. I don't do that. It's more like, hey, this is my life. I really like it. What do you think? Do you like it? Or it's not your vibe. And then if they're like, oh, it's not my vibe. I'm like, okay, no problem. No problem. But if they're like, actually, it is my vibe, I'm like, great. And then we talk about what kind of variation of sex work are you open to? As an example, you guys hear me say it all the time. I'm not really interested in dating a stripper or an escort. Not because I think there's anything wrong with being an escort or a stripper. Not at all, girls. Not at all, boys. Not at all, they's. You do you. But for my lifestyle... I don't really want a partner that works nights. I don't really like the atmosphere of strip clubs. Escorting, no problem, but the hours kind of suck and you're often traveling. So I'm just not interested and I'm monogamous. So even though in sex work, having sex with a client isn't exactly the same as not being monogamous, it sort of has a relationship to it. And if you followed porn stars, including Adam22 or Land of the Plug, or people like that, or even escorts will tell you, sometimes when you have sex for work, you don't want to make love at home. And honestly, I need to make love like once, twice a day. I want to do it all the time. So I kind of need my partner uh, saving it for me. You feel me? I kind of need them to save it for me. At the end of the day, this is about you, your joy, your happiness, and finding a person and a job that's compatible with that. It's not about demonizing other people. It's not about pretending that it's perfect. There are pros and cons to every job. So for me, Brittany, I have a lot more pros than cons with sex work. And that's why I continue to do it. I have a lot more pros than cons with YouTube. That's why I continue to do it. Every other job I had before this, too many cons. Burnout galore. Negativity, depression, anxiety. Mm -mm. But when I do YouTube, when I do OnlyFans, I feel great. I feel alive. I feel happy and joyful. I mean, look at me. This is the life. 
This is a life that I build for myself every day. It's a life I will never take for granted. And it is my perfect life. And I worked really hard to get here. And you can too. You absolutely can have a healthy relationship with both being a YouTuber and being an OnlyFans person or adult worker. You just got to figure out how. Okay. With that said, I'd love to hear your stories down below. If you're a sex worker, if you do adult work, if you're a YouTuber, how do you create balance? Why is it your joy? Why did you choose this job? I'm just so curious. And with that said, let me know if you guys have any follow-up questions, if you want me to do another video about this. If you guys give me enough questions, maybe I'll make a solo video. I'm not sure. But either way, I love this subject matter and I could talk about it all the time. So let me know. Okay, guys, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Oh, and before I go, do you guys know that I'm doing vlogs? I have been doing vlogs. They've been a lot of fun. The goal is to definitely post as much as possible, except Tuesdays, because that's my date day with my person. So the goal is to post as much as possible, and I'm having so much fun with it. It's been just so much fun showing you my life. If you guys are interested, check it out on YouTube members, Level 2s, uh, BTS Behind the Scenes, Discord members, Patreon members. You guys can get access to them there if you guys want to see the behind the scenes of my life. Okay, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. So my head in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da.